This is John Reed, and I'm rejoined by Steve Wilson at Constellation Connected Enterprise. Day one, how are you doing? Good, John. Thanks for having me. We just had a really interesting discussion about identity, which is a focal point of your research, though you're squabbling a little bit with yourself around the, how you're going to call that research going forward. Yeah, look, I think it's about data. Um, I want to shift the, the, what we talk about from identity to data. A yeah. Digital identity is, is stuff that you need to find out about people. If you think about it, digital identity is, is just data. Now, this is going to sound like a sterile kind of techie thing to say, but online data is all you got. I don't know anything about you, John, except for what I can get online. Right. Now, if I can make those signals reliable and I know where they've come from and if I want to know your age, I know that you've told me your age, um, if I can get some certainty in those signals and some reliability, then I can solve a much bigger problem and it's about the provenance of information. Right. Now, before we get into your strong views on blockchain, which I think have been borne out over time to a large extent, I want to talk with you about how you view yourself. Do you consider yourself, for example, a curmudgeon? Do you think of yourself as a techno-optimist? How, how do you sort of see yourself in all of this? Um, look, I like to call myself a scientist. I was trained in science 30 or 40 years ago. I did physics, and um, I've still got a scientific worldview. But look, um, you, you, your viewers can't, um, your, re your listeners can't view my constellation name tag, which, which has the... Um, the slogan "Running with Scissors," ah. um, and what I, you know that we've all been asked to put a, a, a little badge on our on our lanyards. Um, and I say "Running with Scissors" because I don't mind taking some intellectual risks, mm. and I don't mind being wrong. In fact, don't tell Ray, but I like being wrong. Occasionally, I mm. actually get a bit of a thrill from being from having an argument, losing an argument to a smart person who shows me a new way of looking at things. He didn't mention that in his intro of you. No, he might not have. <laughs> so um, it's. Uh, it's just narrow cast this, um, this. So, so you're not an optimist <laughs> or a pe pessimist. You, you're going to go where the data takes you. Oh, look, and I'm, I'm not that boring. I am an optimist. I think that there's nothing better than the internet. I, I think it's fantastic. But I guess um, partly, I'm a, partly I'm a scientist, partly I'm a little bit slow. And I don't jump at shadows. Um, my, my intuition about blockchain early on, and I first read the blockchain paper uh, when it was about five years old, and my intuition about it was that it was fascinating because I understood the double spin problem. But as soon as people started making claims about blockchain for identity or blockchain for supply chain, I started to feel really uneasy. Now, I admit I spent about 12 months um, really gestating because there's so much enthusiasm out there and some really smart people are working on it. And it would be crazy for me to say that they're well, I think wrong. Well, I think it's important to go back to that time when I mean, the hype around it was incredible. I oh, mean, yeah. I and I don't want to cast aspersions on Constellation's own events at while we're taping at an event, but I recall an event here where Constellation would not Constellation, but but a speaker here presented in blockchain is basically as big as the internet itself, right? Like th there was a time back I was then. There. I remember that speech. Th there was a time back then when that was the level of of hype that was involved. Now I do think we have stepped back from yes, that have. type of hyperbole at the moment and this all crystallized on may 3rd 2016 when you wrote a post called blockchain almost everything you read is wrong <laughs> and one of the things you said in that post was and i will quote the blockchain only does one thing and it doesn't even do that very well right so why don't you take us back in time a little bit and how did the, did you just wake up one day and say i've like i've researched this long enough it's time for yep. me to put my stake in the ground here yeah and and one of the catalysts was that speech that you refer to. That speech um, included things like let's transform democracy using the blockchain because of consensus. Mm. And it really disturbed me that there are magic words in blockchain discourse, consensus, trust, um, trustlessness. Um, the idea of consensus has been blown out of proportion. And when I said that everything you read is wrong, what I meant very carefully was you know, the word consensus is not what you think. When people say that this blockchain algorithm could be used for, to transform democracy. It's a huge category error. Right. And, and just to be clear, I don't, I've read a fair amount of your work on this. I don't believe you've ever had any objection with blockchain's original use case Absolutely. around cryptocurrency. Well, with one, with one exception, um, I, I don't think that blockchain, in it, I don't think the Bitcoin blockchain should have ever gone live. Mm. 
And let me explain why I say that. Um, the, the double spend problem, we don't need to go into too much detail, but the double spend problem, how, does, how do you make sure that cryptocurrency doesn't get spent twice when it's only ones and zeros and you can't tell copies from originals? For 30 years, we thought that you'd need a, a central digital bank, um, a mint, to oversee every currency transaction. But the genius of the Bitcoin blockchain was that it crowdsourced that oversight so that the whole crowd agreed that Bitcoin moved from Alice to Bob without anybody needing to know about Alice's keys or Bob's keys mm. without an administrator. Now, the term consensus is saying, look, the, the crowd, 8,000 Bitcoin miners all agree that Bitcoin went once and once only from Alice to Bob. Now, the Nakamoto paper written um, in 2007, 2008, um, was a genius piece of cryptography and and uh, business models and um, incentivating people to participate in this network. It was a great piece of work um, and it solved the double spend problem. In theory, what we wound up with was a piece of software that consumes an incredible amount of software just so you can buy a cup, cup of coffee. Um, it's not perfect. We found that there's some utopian idea that nobody would control the network is absolutely false. Um, Nakamoto for all of his or her faults, um, was very idealistic and just didn't anticipate that, you know, mining consortia in China would take over the network. So There goes solved. that claim of immutability, immutability, right, which is uh, one of my – if you ask my pet peeves in this whole thing, that's my bone of contention. It's a bad word. Just stop using that word. It's a bad word. My, my favourite unword is consensus and yours is immutability, absolutely. Look, um, the, the, the paper didn't have to – be implemented. The software didn't have to go live. Now, I've been trolled fairly mercilessly on Twitter for making that statement. And um, people say, oh, Steve, you're censoring the programmers. Well, the hell with it. I am censoring the programmers. I don't think that Bitcoin has contributed to, to the world in the way that Nakamoto expected. But what it did do was that it solved the unsolvable problem. And that is fantastically important. And it led to the second and third generation ledger technologies that we have today. And by and large, those are very good things. And yet, when you wrote this post, your big concern was really sort of the enterprise hyperbolic fanfare around what blockchain could potentially do. Some of the things you said is, it's not going to stamp out corruption in Africa. It's not going to crowdsource policing of the financial system. It's not going to give firefighters unlimited communication channels. So at the time, you were kind of sort of just saying, look, like let's put the brakes on this. Um, but that was 2016, so how, how has everything evolved from you since then? And look, and every one of those counterfactuals is against an actual headline about firefighters using the blockchain for unlimited bandwidth. So yeah. what's happened since then is that people have actually, I think by and large, have come to understand what the thing's good for and what it's not good for. So let's set aside cryptocurrency because it is good for cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, now, can it do consensus across democracy? Can it do these other things? Can it transform data management? Um, no. Um, what the blockchain is really good for is taking a distributed set of, of actors who are already distributed. So let's put that one to bed. The idea that blockchain is fairy dust that you can sprinkle on an organisation like and some sort of catalyst. And force them to distribute, yeah. All of a sudden, you know, imagine a, like a, sprinkling a detergent on, on some water and everything separates out and decentralises. It doesn't work like that. You, blockchain is good when you're already decentralised and you're trying to That was a big admin. point, by the way, that your panellists made today yep. who are trying to use blockchain in the field. In the yep. panel you moderated, they were making the point that you can't use this as a wedge to transform organisations. Yeah, Mike is, Kale and Aaron Dutta were very eloquent um, on where their successes have been over the years have been on organisations that already understand centralisation and decentralisation and they're willing to solve the problem before the tech comes in. You know, I think mm. The uncomfortable truth is that blockchain doesn't create decentralisation. It allows certain things to happen in a decentralised environment. And therefore, two things follow. One, the really good use cases have got to be decentralised to start with. And secondly, if you want to really decentralise a current thing, like the monetary system, it, it's more than the tech. You have to get up over a, an obstacle of, of change management. And um, change management is what kills most blockchain projects because people understand that if the end state... Even if the end state's better than what we have today, the cost of getting there, the legal cost of rewriting contracts and retraining risk management, um, mm. recasting the way your organisation works, firing the board and getting a new management structure, for example, um, even if you wanted to do that, the cost is incalculable. 
Right. And, and I do think it's also important as we wade through the possible use cases here just to get a handle on the levels of adoption now. Because one thing is just because there's no no live projects to point to at the moment in the enterprise doesn't mean that there never will be. But it is important to acknowledge about six months ago, I went into an exercise with some people where we went looking for a live project at scale in the enterprise. And this included people connected to, if you go on like a hyperledger and a look at a lot of the corporate sponsors, this included people who work for those sponsors. And how did you go? We could not find a single yep. live production example at scale. Yep. Um, we heard a lot of talk about pilot this and pilot that, but that's been going on for quite some time now. Yeah, and I agree. I, there's, I, people ask me which ones are going well, and I can only show you sectors where the, where the early work is promising. Um, now, what's changed is that people have um, better critical thinking. Can we bring Vince Cerf back into this? There is critical thinking now. Um, for about four or five years, I've gone to conferences and people have said, you know, 90% of blockchain pilots are going to fail. Or you see decision trees, you know, if this, then that, if this, then that. And the decision tree works through and most use cases should not go to blockchain. Now, people walk out of those presentations going, oh, 90% oh, oh, are going to fail. Luckily, I'm in the 10%. And there's been this sort of unwarranted optimism for years that people think that their blockchain project is going to be different. Mm. Now, I don't get that anymore. And, you know, when Mike and Aaron were talking today, there was a lot more um, understanding, a bit of critical thinking about how do, we get, how do we put the things in place where a distributed ledger is going to make sense. Mm. Yeah. But blockchain, of course, isn't the only distributed ledger technology, so that becomes another area of critique and, and question, right? Because it seems like to this point a lot of people have have been able to find deep pockets to sponsor blockchain initiatives, quote-unquote, when in fact they should have been approaching it more from what is the problem we're trying to solve and yep. there are all kinds of distributed ledger options they could have considered. Yeah, and look, we started this conversation, John, by talking about science and research, and <clears throat> that's me. I, I think that the money... Um, has largely been spent for a purpose. People have learned, um, but instead of, you know, quote-unquote investing in blockchain, it's it's better to think about this as investing in R&D. Sometimes it boils down to organizational structure. So here's my question for you, Steve, and maybe you can clear something up for me. In, in my pursuits of potential blockchain use cases, the things that I have found most intriguing all involve one very interesting criteria beyond decentralization, and that is transparency. In the most cases I have seen, it's the idea that the that the stakeholders involved in this have a right to know what's going on, yeah. and as much a right as anyone else on the on the so-called blockchain. So an example might be there's some there's been some blockchains that work around land titles, for example, and verifying that, which is a you see a lot of public sector things like that where, okay, here's a public sector has a responsibility to be transparent yeah. about how these things are verified. And I don't know if that's always required characteristic, but what it strikes me is that in a lot of corporate settings, you have supply chains that are often run by a behemoth that may have no interest in yep. accountability or transparency. So what is their motivation to expose all of that to the broader network? That's the thing I've been trying to understand. Well, this is switching costs as well. This I is mean, is that your experience? I mean, is transparency like yes. a... At the um, core of a lot of this, it look, seems I don't, like it is. I don't find that land titles is actually a good use case mm. for blockchain. I'm not aware of one at all. Let me also just sidebar here for a minute. I've been using blockchain um, quite loosely, so I'm not, I'm not following my own prescriptions. Mm. Um, I, I ask people to be rigorous in their language, and I'm using blockchain really broadly here as distributed ledger or whatever. Um, transparency, absolutely. One of the best things ever written in this space was from Richard Brown um, at at uh, R3, he wrote the quarter white paper some years ago. And he said, if I, if I remember right, um, you might have a number of banks together that are all trying to cooperate around a complicated financial instrument and, and a ledger of transactions. And every bank wants to know that every other bank sees the same thing. And they want to know that you know mm. that I know that you're seeing the same thing. I think that that's the transparency that you might be. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's what, what I find really intriguing about transparency. And so I think you also said that um, some things need not be so radically transparent, and I think that's true as well. So what blockchain use cases under development catch your eye as this could be a really viable, interesting use of this technology? Um, some of the stock exchanges around the world um, are, are working on a, on a decentralized ledger of stock movements, 
And I think that's really interesting because it is absolutely about transparency then, that everybody needs to know that they're on the same page. Um, there are also complicated financial instruments. Court has always been strong in this area where the cost of settlement is something that you want to take out of the system. Uh, you know, the, the person in the street thinks that T plus three trading is just so that banks can hang on to money for three days and somehow make interest out of it. Uh, no, um, settlement is time consuming because often there's a human element of, of auditing people's um, transactions at the end of the day and um, being able to shrink that down is super important. And finally, I, th I am persuaded that some of the supply chain work, and there's going to be a big fat asterisk on what I'm about to say, but some of the supply chain work is very interesting because it can be shown that the cost of business in complicated supply chains and, and shipping, um, the cost of business is um, dominated by the cost of dispute resolution, and it can take days and weeks and months to figure out what the hell went wrong you know, with a shipment of rotten avocados. Now, mm. the blockchain doesn't stop avocados going bad, but it, mm. it may help you find out um, faster in an agreed way that something happened at some point well, in the Well, and there chain. was a pretty big um, – there's a pretty big Chinese pilot going on around food perishables, right? Yep. And so that's something that is sort of interesting, yeah. right? The, the notion of the food supply chain is intriguing because there's a transparent public interest in that. Yeah, and look, and it's some of those projects are being marketed – um, fairly hyperbolically on the basis that we're going to reduce food poisoning through better information. And I think that that's a very indirect claim to make. The direct claim you can make is that if there is some perishables and you want to know who to blame, then you're going to get better data much, much faster on, a, on an agreed distributed ledger. Mm. Uh, totally agree. Now, I mentioned an asterisk. My, my problem with supply chain as a category is that it's not disorderly. So sorry about mm. the double negative, but... These blockchains are very, very good, or distributed ledgers, very, very good at synchronising agreement across a whole bunch of parties who are distributed and they don't know what's going on. So they're disorderly. Um, but yeah, I want to read a, I want to read something you wrote about that because I think this is a critically important point. This was in a, um, a piece you did called What Blockchain Consensus is All About, and you said, finally, remember that blockchain consensus creates order out of the deliberate chaos of cryptocurrency yeah. where key holders are allowed to go unregistered. In many of the extended blockchain use cases, such as Internet of Things or supply chain, as you just referenced, there is no such disorder. You, you go on to say the IoT devices tend to have serial numbered chips to securely hold the private keys. Supply chain operators are generally authorized employees, typically using dedicated terminal equipment and warehouses, etc. These types of networks are orderly to begin with and don't need an elaborate consensus algorithm. So now we're back to your consensus issue there. Yeah, so look, um, consensus, I think it's fair to say that in any blockchain or distributed ledger, the consensus is about the order in which things happened. Mm. Um, you know, we, we use the word ledger quite deliberately. Sadly, people confuse it with database. You know, a ledger is, a, is an order, a time-ordered sequence of what mm. happened, an account of what happened. And if you can um, agree on the state of the ledger in a distributed way, um, and that's kind of magical for some use cases, and that's really what a blockchain is really good at. If you already have order, if you already have a whole bunch of people in a supply chain that are working with, you know, imagine FedEx people. They all walk around with special dedicated terminal devices. They're modified cell phones with a whole lot of FedEx software, and, and these courier drivers are not strangers. They're, they're weak links in the chain. They are highly regulated. They go through police checks. FedEx knows where they live. Um, it's not the sort of free-floating private keys that Bitcoin and the original blockchain are all about. Um, so that's what I mean about order out of chaos. If, if you have that much order, where you know where the FedEx delivery driver lives and you know that they've got a driver's licence and um, you know that they've got insurance, it doesn't feel to me as though consensus adds anything. You know, mm. what, what are you asking the crowd to tell you about the FedEx driver that you don't already know? Mm. And that's what I mean. You need to be uh, critical thinking again. You need to just think about what was that consensus algorithm for and what's it telling you that you didn't already know. And on this topic, I want to give you a chance to set the record straight because uh, I, I've been poking a little bit of fun with you around a couple of your attention-grabbing headlines. Uh, I sort of did the same to you in a weekly hits and misses column recently where I sometimes get a little snarky. And I featured one of your posts on this topic, Order Out of Chaos, which you just kind of referred to just now. And I said, Constellation Steve Wilson really doesn't like blockchain, and he'll happily tell you why. <laughs> now, a couple of readers came 
came to your defense, perhaps, or at least the defense of nuance, including Greg Salmon, and he said to me uh, that not sure how you got the impression that Steve Wilson doesn't like blockchain. In my mind, he still likes it, but maybe he does not like how others justify using their blockchain concept. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty thoughtful rebuttal on Greg's part. Thank you, Greg. Would you like to set the record straight there? Uh, what if I disagree? I don't like blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like blockchain, do you? Look, um, I'm right, aren't I? You don't like blockchain. Just say it, Steve. The simplest thing for me to say would be I don't like blockchain. Um, See, I, I Greg, think. I told you, man. I told you. Here, here, what I told Greg was I said, I would bet Steve Wilson's view of blockchain's use cases is very different than yours, and that I haven't seen a single example of Wilson's for any, any enterprise use cases. And I was referring to your blogs. He likes it for cryptocurrency, but that's about it. I wasn't counting that. <laughs> anyway. No, we always say cryptocurrency. Well. I, I, I just said you've been consistent about your skepticism beyond cryptocurrency and that I would sit you down and ask you more about that. And here we are. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, so when you say you don't like it, you're, you're kind of joking in a sense because what you're saying is that you're very skeptical about its applications beyond the cryptocurrency context is all. Look, I, I think that the reason why you need consensus and you need to reach consensus in a distributed way I think that that nuance is just lost on most people, and it does annoy me that blockchain has um, a life of its own beyond the cut and dried problem that it solved, and it solved it well. In theory, it solved consensus brilliantly. In practice, as I said, I don't think that the Bitcoin blockchain um, is a piece of technology that's doing us any good by being out there in the wild, but there are plenty of second and third generation technologies that are much better using different, more efficient algorithms. Um, but, you know, hopefully I've put in enough nuance there. I think that there are distributed ledgers that have yeah. got application in certain areas. I think that the benefit of the supply chain is not to make it more trustworthy. You can't do anything about a bad farmer who, who puts contaminated produce into one end of a supply chain. But you can find out about that quicker and you can rewind a, a bad transaction faster with, at lower cost. Mm. So I get all of that. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think... And stepping back from that humorous part of the podcast, my reading on your views, correct me if I'm wrong, is I don't I don't think you would be the kind of person that would allow whether you liked something or not to really get in the way of if if companies were adopting it for reasons that were persuasive, you would obviously recognize that you're just looking for that and you're evaluating that and seeing what's yeah. what. Absolutely. I yeah. I wrote a, an article about Hyperledger um, probably three years ago, and it was after a, um, to pay credit. It was at a, after an IBM event. Uh, IBM went out hard with a number of Hyperledger fabric projects, and some of them were very compelling. And um, you know, I think that I, I think that I admitted as much in, in my blog that um, that that they were now f discovering things in the third generation that were really useful. Right, and and I think where you and I might agree is I actually think the blockchain market in the enterprise is in a, a much healthier place now than it was several years ago. Because I think that there is a much more, I think, critical understanding. I think there are still some companies that are, in my opinion, overspending on overhyped pilots. But in general, I think there's much more of a thoughtful thing. Vendors are using it much more carefully yes. in their keynotes. They're not they're not spreading it around like mayonnaise to try to make everything go down better with yep. Like used to be the mayonnaise on the AI sandwich, and now they're kind of like separating out the ingredients. The so I think correct. I personally think we're in a healthier space, and I'm I still think there will be use cases, but I view it much in a much more practical, perhaps boring way, which is eventually it will be a tool in a toolkit to solve certain kinds of problems. And when it fits, you'll use it, and when it yep. doesn't, you won't. You know, which is very different than the revolution we were talking about, but. It is what it is. And look, we, we at Constellation think that, too, it, it has certainly changed the conversation. It's made some things possible, and so it's enabled new network business models. Um, I personally think that even if you see the beauty of a network business model and a decentralized way of administering and governing, um, you'll still find that blockchain is not essential. Mm. Um, what's essential is getting together around the table and having a new contract to, to ship goods. Um, which again, that sounds kind of boring. But I if think you can you just took a whack at smart contracts, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, how much time have we got to, <laughs> to get on the smart contracts? We haven't even got into smart contracts yet. No, oh, wow, there's a lot of your, your land title there. skepticism certainly uh, implied that you're not a big fan of the smart um, contract. But. 
land titles is just nowhere near the level of chaos and nobody would want land titles be, to be mm. chaotic. You would not want buyers and sellers of land to be mm. um, to be unknown to each other or unknown to the government. There's, there's too much at stake. Let's, let's move towards a close and wrap these two things together a little bit. Um, blockchain is often proposed as a next-gen solution to the problems of identity we were mm. discussing earlier. How, how do you view those two areas? Because you spent a lot of time on both of them. Yep, yep. Identity is my career. Um, look, the first thing to be said is that identity for, for a long time has been subject to a whole lot of false intuitions and misconceptions and, and really lousy metaphors, um, one of which, for example, it's it's completely standard now, but we think about identity providers. The IDP is a box in almost every identity architecture, and the IDP, by its very words, assumes that identity is sort of a good or a service that can be provided, and it's not. Um, identity is about relationships. But, you know, I know enough about you, John, to sit down right now and to do a podcast. Otherwise, I know almost mm-hmm. nothing about you. So in what sense do you have an identity in my mind? Um, mm-hmm. There are some things that I know about you that are very important and germane to this conversation. Um, everybody agrees that you should identify as little as possible for privacy point of view and, and, for, and for security. You know, we don't want this toxic waste data everywhere. So if you talk to anybody, and any identity professional, they'll say to you, yep, we should identify as little as possible. So if the actual stock and trade of what we're doing is to be minimised, we don't want identity. It's just the wrong word. It's, it's not what we should be going after. We should be going after attributes or verified claims or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not a blockchain observation. That's just an observation yeah. over many years that the identity industry has got some, some, some pretty catchy phrases that we use to get attention, but... They're misleading. Along comes blockchain. At a really interesting time, it's got some magical properties and there was false intuitions that you'd put identity and blockchain together. That's actually got what got me out of my, um, my um, caution about blockchain and got me writing about it um, was that there were so many startups founded by blockchain zealots who didn't know anything about identity but they were out there raising money and that, that was weird. <laughs> um, the thing about identity is that the thing, it's usually about fairly intimate relationships between two people. You know, I want to know whether you're over 21 years of age or not because I want to sell you some liquor online. You know, it's a one-to-one thing. You don't decentralise that. You don't ask the crowd, how old is John? Um, I ask an authority. There will be a third party who's, who's prepared to vouch for your age. And that's mm. the way that life works. You, they're very, you know, blockchain is about, about distributing or reaching consensus about something and um identity is not the sort of thing that you crowdsource mm. now there are some interesting things and i'll absolutely pay credit to um, um sovereign foundation for example has been nominated for one of our um, innovation awards at constellation and they're doing some good work in this whole self-sovereign identity area it's time for another podcast i think john but um the sovereign mm. foundation is working on a distributed ledger that records certain metadata about um, life cycle events, and it gets very technical very quickly. But um, the, the, the people at Sovereign themselves say, look, there's actually not a thing in our architecture called identity. It's about verifying claims about people. It comes back to attributes. If You want to know where an attribute's come from. You want to know who's seen it. You want to know if it's been released with the permission of the, of the individual concerned. Um, you know, it's all about plumbing data. It's about verified attributes. And... Um, I think that in the next few years I'd like to see a bit of discipline where the, the problem that we're being solved is actually being called out for what it is, mm-hmm. and it's about data hygiene. It's about the provenance of data. It's about controlling data. And um, identity has been a sort of a cool handle for all of this stuff to date, but I don't think it's the word that we should use anymore. And I want to ask you about one more thing, which is machine identity. Um, one of the people I respect the most in our whole industry is goes by the name of M. M. Renal on Twitter. Um, He's part of a startup called Occam, and they're working a lot on um, machine-based identity and trust in the IoT space. He's careful not to put all their eggs in the blockchain basket, but he likes blockchain for IoT-based, machine-based kinds of identity issues, and he cites crypto cryptographic identity management based on a W3C standard called decentralized identifiers. Yep. And what Renal's trying to point out in, in his work, and I don't want to turn it into like you versus him, 
but but in general, I think it's an interesting concept, which is that that all these devices must be uniquely identifiable. But there's, to your point, it's it doesn't have necessarily always the stakes of um, a human identity verification because in some cases you just want to know if the machine is working or not, or if it's low on yeah this or that attribute. And he thinks that long story short, he thinks blockchain could be a really good solution for that. Look, I don't get it. Um, from what I know, I just don't get it. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. If there's an IoT out there, um, and one day there's a whole nest of um, of autonomous vehicles that are buzzing around, or I don't know what they are. Maybe they're delivering injections to people out in the bush who need to be inoculated. Um, maybe they're doing deliveries. Maybe they're all, I don't know what they're doing, but sci-fi vision drawn of thousands of things literally buzzing around the, around the air. Um, if a battery goes flat, you want to know exactly which drone it was that needs to go out there and have its battery changed or if it's broken. Um, you don't crowdsource anything to do with that. You don't crowdsource, hey, which, which battery's gone flat? My point being that every single device in an IoT, at some point, somebody knows everything that you need to know about that device. And so what does that leave for blockchain or consensus? I just don't mm. see what problem it's solving. Having so said you that, I think you I think, think there would already be there would already be a sequential order of key keys essentially I think it comes pre-ordered. Um, yeah, it's yeah. called key lifecycle management. I think somebody knows that mm. you know, these drones have got SIM cards in them, and they're they're on a cellular network, and they're fabulous. But yeah. but people have managed those keys. Having said all of that, I think identity of things is fascinating. I, I wish that we didn't call it identity, but there are absolutely there's got to be a lot of work on the things that you need to know about devices, and moreover. You need to be able to loosely couple devices to, to people. Mm. So I've done a bit of work on the internet of cars, and that's going to be amazing. You know, a car is already, they say, it's 40 computers and 40 local area networks on wheels. Um, one day, you know, you're going to be taking your kids to school and you're going to pick up a friend and the kid is going to sit in the back with a connected Barbie doll and the Barbie doll is going to hook onto the car network and all of a sudden the car manufacturer is going to know a lot about the passengers. And... Um, we need to be quite careful to decouple identity in the Internet of Things. And I've done a little bit of work about that. Um, so, look, happy to, to sort of leave it at that. I, I, I think yeah. it's extremely important. Um, I'm yet to be convinced that blockchain is an important part of the mix. Yeah, maybe I can get them to come down here next year and we can revisit this conversation. And and to be fair, I think there his company is working on a lot of different things to try to establish standards around this, which I think is right on because there do need to be uh, open standards that, that companies adhere to around this. and You mentioned the W3C work on DID. Um, it's very new. The, the working group is um, probably a year old. Very important work. Um, the, the idea of a DID is that it's a, a data structure that I control and I can transmit that data from my device, from my phone or my drone or my, my um, pacemaker. And I might have a whole lot of DIDs, distributed identities. I'll have a different DID for each sort of major walk of life. Um, really good idea. And the, the protocol that W3C is putting together is probably going to be quite important plumbing for some transactions um, going forward. It remains to be seen if it's sensible to, to abstract it up to, mm. you know, Steve Wilson having 13 or 35 different DIDs, they're called. Um, I've got some reservations about whether it abstracts all the way up to me controlling 35 DIDs, but mm. you know, on my behalf, there will be pieces of software and intelligent agents that are using this protocol. Steve, we're not out of topics, but we are out of time. Thanks a lot for joining me. That was an excellent discussion. What a great pleasure, John. Thanks. Yeah, take care.